thank you, everyone. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to cap this uh, super exciting day of talks. I hope that you've reserved a, a, a synapse uh, to process what I have to say, maybe two. Uh, so uh, I uh, work as a scientist and an engineer uh, uh, studying animal behavior and its neural basis, and I also um, occasionally uh, try to extract interesting principles of how nature works and uh, build new technology. Uh, by night, I uh, occasionally moonlight for science fiction uh, film uh, uh, makers, directors, and writers, and um, I, I, I've worked on a number of projects, some of which you've probably heard of, Tron Legacy, uh, the Battlestar Galactica prequel, Caprica, uh, and a few others that I hope you haven't heard of. Um, and and uh, I've had a lot of interesting discussions with these uh, people about what's going to happen with the merger of man and machine. Uh, people uh, will ask me, you know, so when are we going to be half human, half robot? Uh, uh, what year will we be genuflecting in front of uh, Skynet? And uh, my, these conversations usually end with me going, how do I know? Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't often have great insights for them. But one thing I've picked up from them is um, that they sometimes have a difficult time envisioning uh, the possibilities of neuroprosthetic technology. I hope in this next slide I don't get in trouble with my wife because she used to work for George Lucas. But here's uh, one vision that science fiction has given us of what the neuroprosthetic could do. I actually think the potential of this technology is vastly greater than this. I think it has the potential to allow us to re-engineer the very uh, essence of awareness. And, and further, I think that uh, this reimagining of consciousness, if it goes the way that I hope it does, may actually be integral to at some day uh, saving our planet. So I've come to this view through my own science, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, that, that science. This is the animal I spent my life uh, working on. It's a black ghost weekly electric fish. They hunt in the night, in the total darkness of the murky rivers of the Amazon River Basin. And uh, these animals uh, uh, swim by, by moving this beautiful fin. They send ripples forward and backward according to the direction they want to move. And what's really cool about them is that they emit this weak electric field, kind of like a radar system. And anything intercepting that field um, is detected and allows the animal to attack it. So I'm going to show you a, a video of one of these animals actually doing this behavior. It's in uh, infrared light, uh, so it's kind of murky. Uh, and it also goes by super fast. So I want you to pay attention, close attention. I'll play it twice. So here it is. Um, what you're going to see is this red bug. And there, see the, the, the animal quickly reversed and uh, struck at it. And the next time I show you this, I want you to think of the following. I want to put this idea in your, bread, in your brain pan. So, um, you know, when you think about lions stalking for prey, you imagine them going up a, around a line of bushes and carefully planning their line of attack and then going after their prey. The next time I, you see this video, I want you to ask the question whether this animal could have anything like that kind of strategy. So here it is again. There's the prey, detects it with its tail, bam. So I think the answer is clearly not, right? Uh, this, this is a very reactive animal. Uh, and so um, some years ago, with actually Joel Burdick here at Caltech, we started to look at, so what does this mean in terms of behavioral control? And so with Joel, uh, we computed, uh, did some, some computational estimates and some simulations of where this animal can perceive its, its, its prey. And so it's this beautiful omnidirectional space um, and anything within that space, it can quickly attack. Um, but th the point is that it only extends a few centimeters away from the surface of the body, and so this animal is trapped in this reactive mode, uh, really no potential for consciousness because it basically just has to react to what it perceives very rapidly. Um, now, why am I telling you this? Well, the reason I'm telling you this is that fossil evidence shows us that we come from fish. And so this is actually uh, a, a reconstruction of an animal we think might be either in our direct line of ancestry or very close to it. It's Euthanopteran, 400 million years ago. This animal uh, perceived its world with eyes rather than with an electric field. But the important thing here is actually when we did the analysis, it turns out the amount of space that they could perceive through wasn't that much bigger, which was a real big shock to me. And it turns out to have nothing to do with their eyes. It has everything to do with the physics of light and water, which is not very favorable. These animals can only perceive about 10 meters out. Uh, and it's totally just um, uh, that, that's due to the, the, the fact that light is attenuated so rapidly in, in, in water. 
Um, so uh, you're very familiar with this kind of situation. That is, moving through a space, but only being able to react uh, at the last moment before you, know, you run into a deer, like this, right? So um, uh, how did we uh, uh, go from, well, let me show you first an animation of what this animal's life would have been like, you know, pursuing its everyday prey, what your life was like 400 million years ago. So here, here you are with a prey, uh, sort of you meander through the space, and then you rapidly attack the prey. You know? So there isn't much time to, uh, to, to, to process anything about the space. You basically have to be in automatic control mode. Now, we came from these animals, but we are animals that think a lot about the future. In fact, some of us think so much about the future that half of us are in therapy for it. <laughs> so how do we get from this kind of situation, this kind of animal, to the animals that we are? Well, I think a key step of the process was actually this animal, Tiktaalik. Now, 350 million years ago, this is what you were. You lurched up onto land, and a huge thing happened in terms of your visual system. Suddenly, you're in a medium where a ray of light can go 10,000 times further than uh, it could in water. And now, so this has gigantic effects on the animal's brain. And that shouldn't be something that surprises us. In evolutionary time, this is really the way things work. And this quote kind of nicely encapsulate that, encapsulates that. It is not the animal's brain that organizes its world, but the evolutionary ecology of the animal that organizes its brain. And so let's take a look then at what your situation as one of these early land animals might have been like in contrast to the situation in water. So here we are with our uh, sensory bubble, now much greatly expanded. Uh, so you see a prey through the trees. Now, you could take that path, but now keep in mind that your prey also have big sensory fields, and so it would probably get away, and you wouldn't be successful. You could do this, but that might mean a dip through the water. That's not pleasant. So, but this strategy is kind of like the big cat strategy. You walk a line, of, a line of bushes, and you ambush at the last second. Your success chances are much higher. So for the first time in our evolutionary history, at around this point then, it really pays to be contemplating different possible futures. And I think this is actually a central moment in the genesis of our awareness, of our consciousness. It's well best sort of put by, by this psychologist, Bruce Bridgman, who said that consciousness is the operation of the plan executing mechanism, enabling behavior to be driven by plans rather than immediate environmental contingencies. Now, so in brief, thinking ahead is not worth doing unless you can see ahead. So <clears throat> let me put all of, our, all of life that we know has evolved in terms of animals on this one chart where we have how far you can see versus time in years from present. We start off with unicellular, eukaryotic, single cell animals, autonomous animals. They saw about a 10 millionth of a meter ahead of them, very short distance. A billion years later, these cells start, had probably previously started to express things like cadherins that let them adhere together. They form globs, and they eventually form something like this animal. What's the advantage? You, you, you are 50 trillion cells. You've given up all your individuality here. Well, you get to be inside of a fearsome predator, pre predator where nobody will mess with you. But more importantly for this talk, you're seeing 10 meters out a huge leap in your perceptual envelope. Now, 300 million, laters, million years later, however, you come to this animal, a land animal, and now you can really see far out. This, you know, around a kilometer, we can see a rabbit on a good day from two and a half kilometers. So here we are at the present time. And I think a question we could ask is, do we see far enough? So here's our brain now. We essentially still are animals that are living in the here and now. What we really care about is our kith and kin. Uh, we can think about things in the next few days. On a special day, maybe our retirement. But we're pretty much focused on a local kind of small orbit of, of, of awareness. Um, and an especially big blind spot for this kind of awareness is the distant consequences of our actions. And anybody who's uh, been watching their weight and, and given into the temptation of eating a cheeseburger knows what I'm talking about. 
But so, this is a problem for us currently, however, because this is the world that we live in. This is our environment now. We're globally interconnected. But in particular, we have a phenomenon called climate change, which is almost like a, a custom-made 18-wheel truck to drive through the blind spot of our awareness, because it arises due to the emission of a gas that is imperceptible and odorless, and the consequences of those gases are decades off in the future. We're very, we have a very hard time coping with this. Now, it's not like we don't have some tools for awareness beyond our little sensory bubble. We have things like the internet, Facebook, etc. Uh, these tools are better known for their ability to make us aware of what's going on in the world, however, than to make us care about those things that we're aware of. So I think that there is a very interesting technology, though, coming up called eco-feedback technology, which uh, tries to bring distant consequences back into your sensory envelope. Anybody who's driven a Prius knows what I'm talking about, gives you these instantaneous outputs of, of how many miles per gallon you're driving. But this, this example, I think, is really cool. It's from a Pittsburgh public housing project where they're trying to uh, see if giving people feedback on their energy use would re result in a decline in the amount of energy. So they get these displays, and they get a polar bear. And if they reduce the amount of energy that they're using, then those polar bears get company, and they flourish. And people really love their, to see their polar bears thriving. So it actually has resulted in a decline in the energy consumption of some of these people, even though their energy is being paid for by the government, which is, I think, really uh, the, a nice kicker here. Now, this is great. This is externalized technology, however. You have the option to put it on and off. It's not part of your ambient awareness, right? Uh, this is a gamification of reality. It's a great trick, uh, but it is a trick. Is there a way for us to actually care about these consequences rather than being tricked into caring through gamification. And so, uh, as I said before, in part, of, part of my work is to look at nature and extract models of good technology that we might then deploy. And I've, I've been searching my brain for it, and uh, I, I, I want to tell you a personal story now of something that gave us an epiphany as to uh, uh, how that might occur in terms of uh, systems by which uh, our, our, our brains are, uh, are made to care more about the, the things that we are aware. So this is a picture of our, our baby, uh, our first baby that was just born three months ago, me and my wife. And uh, shortly after having, having this baby, we uh, read a story about a child in Texas who had just been born and abandoned and hung on in a, in a bag on a, on a dark and, and cold Texas night on a random uh, stranger's door. And uh, this is a picture that uh, was in the newspaper. And uh, what me and my wife noticed immediately was that we were, we were brought to tears. And, and, and this is not, that intensity of response would not have occurred before having a baby. And I think everybody who's a parent here knows, knows this effect. It was almost like evolution had reached into our cranium and changed our empathy chip and, and put in the infant upgrade. <laughs> so, so, so I think this, uh, so this is the domain of effective neuroscience, right? This is, this is uh, 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 the, the, the area of, of, of where we need to understand our emotional brain. And, and Insul mentioned earlier stuff about PTSD. We're learning a lot about PTSD, for example. It seems to occur through uh, the amygdala telling the hippocampus over and over again about a tragic event that you've had. And if we attenuate that connection using beta blockers, we can, uh, it's looking like we might be able to help interfere with the formation of PTSD. So I think this technology will be central in the kind of neuroprosthetic I'm imagining. But a second model, uh, which I think is extremely interesting, is the model of the eusocial organisms that have already been referred to. And these are organisms which are, all have independent brains, but they are in a superorganism with only one reproductive female. And what's incredible about these animals is that um, the, their structure is regulated by uh, titers of juvenile hormone, the level of, these ju of juvenile hormone, which can change uh, if, the, if, the, if the hive is under, say, resource depletion stress, 
uh, we, it, it can change the level of the hormone and cause more nurses to be promoted to foragers, which are the bees that go out and find the food. And what's amazing about that is that it really requires a big change in the brain. And so you could think of these animals as, uh, as having something like a, uh, instead of a world wide web, they have a neural wide web, and the currency of information is not electrons, but juvenile hormone. So I think this is a really exciting idea. And uh, of course, uh, 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 Hollywood has, has, has thought of this a little bit. This is the Borg. You will be assimilated. But um, my hope, and I'll close with, with this, my hope is that the science that you've seen today, the brilliant science that you've seen today, will let us do something much more gentle. And that is that um, inst instead of losing our individuality, that when we do a solid for the planet, say something as simple as, as taking out our, our recycling, we will, f we will feel as good as we feel when we take a sick friend chicken noodle soup and experience the gratitude that that friend shares with us. And I think that this may actually let us experience or let us reach a new, a new level of awareness that could have dramatic implications for helping our planet in the future. Thank you.